Good evening. On behalf of Jackson Pan Pharmaceuticals Limited, makers of Doxipal DRL capsules containing doxycycline, Lycorid Prex sachet, and progesterone sustained release tablets as Divagest SR 200 and 300, I'm Dr. Vipin Tyagi along with my teammates, Dr. Deepika Chavda and Mr. Amit Saxena. Wish you a very happy new year and welcome you all to the monthly clinical meeting of the Association of Obstetrician and Gynecologists of Delhi, organized virtually by ESI Basai Darapur, Delhi. We wish to thank Dr. Taru Gupta, Professor and Head, Department of Ops and Gyne, ESI Basai Darapur, for this opportunity to host the, host the meeting. We are sure the topics to be discussed will throw light on the dilemmas in the management of pregnancy complication cases. Welcome to all faculty present with us today, AOGD members and all attendees from across India and abroad who have joined us today. Please keep posting your queries by text in the Q&A box, which will be answered at the end of the session. Please note this webinar is brought to you as knowledge sharing initiative by Jackson Pulse Medical Services. And this session is streaming on Facebook Live. The recording will remain on Jackson Pulse YouTube channel for reference and promotion. I will now request AOGD President Dr. Mala Srivastava to kindly initiate the proceedings. Good evening, everyone. I bring greetings from AOGD. I wish everyone a very happy new year. Hope this year be very brighter, prosperous, healthier for each and every member of AOGD. Today, the monthly meeting is from ESI Basai Dharapur, and I'm sure each and every member who is listening today will benefit immensely from the case presentations of today's evening. Without wasting any time, I request Dr. Mamta to present the secretary's report. Over to you, Dr. Mamta. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you're audible. And you can see my screen? Yeah, yes. we can see your screen, Mamta. Carry yeah. on. Good afternoon, everyone. And I wish all the AOGD members a very happy and uh, healthy new year uh, 2021. And welcome all the members to this uh, AOGD virtual monthly clinical meeting uh, of the day, which is being organized by ES Department of Ops and Gaini, ESI Hospital, uh, Basai Darapur, Delhi. So we have interesting cases lined up for the day and you will be soon hearing them. I shall be very quickly going through the secretary's report. Today's, uh, today we are holding the 10th AOGD virtual monthly clinical meeting of our tenure. And so far we had four uh, AOGD executive meetings held so far, all were held virtually. Uh, this is the list of AOGD events which uh, were held so far in the month of December since we have our last AOGD virtual monthly clinical meeting which was organized by Sir Gangaram Hospital on 18th December. On 19th December, there was a webinar on pioneering PCOS which was being organized, which was organized by Reproductive Endocrinology Committee of AOGD. On 20th December, there was a webinar on endoscopy update organized by Endoscopy Committee AOGD and the Global Community of Hysteroscopy. On 20th December, there was a webinar on 22nd Gyne update, which was by IMA Janakpuri under ages of AOGD. And on 26th December, there was a webinar on 18 to 14 weeks uh, uh, ultrasound and biochemical markers uh, organized jointly by Fog ST, uh, AOGD, Narchi Delhi, and Sono School. On 26th December, there was a webinar on breast screening, uh, breast examination, and anemia by Breast and Cervical Cancer Awareness Prevention AOGD subcommittee. And these are the forthcoming AOGD events which are being which are planned for the month of January and February. As you see here, uh, they all are planned virtually. On 5th January, we are organizing a webinar on adenomyosis under the banner of AOGD Endoscopy Committee. On 14th January, uh, FAQs on endometriosis. On 15th January, FAQs on AUB. On 16th January, FAQs on breast cancer. On 23rd January, there's a webinar on cervical cancer prevention under the ages of AOGD. On 1st February, FAQs on diabetes in pregnancy. And on 17th February, FAQs on fibroid uterus under the ages of AOGD. 
So uh, our next AOGD virtual monthly clinical meeting will be on 29th January, which will be organized by Ramanohar Loya Hospital. So we look forward to seeing you and thank you. And with this, now I hand over to Dr. Uh, Taru Gupta for further proceedings of the day. Over to you, Dr. Taru. I will stop sharing now. Thank you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Ah, okay. So good evening, all. I welcome all of you to the AOGD monthly clinical meeting, the first meeting of the year 2021 on the first day of the year, organized by the Department of Ops and Gaini ESI PGMSR Basai Darakur. Out with the old and in with the new, starting the new year with, with more motivation and positivity, I wish all of you a very healthy, happy and safe new year. 2020 has been very stressful year for all of us because of COVID, but with a new day comes new strength and new thoughts. Let's hope that 2021 will bring good luck, more happiness and stronger relationships in the lives of all AOG teams. Now we begin the presentation of the day. We have three interesting cases. The first case will be discussed by Dr. Divya. She is a postgraduate student and it will be discussed by Dr. Priyanka Mathi. She's an assistant professor. Uh, thank you, ma'am. A very good afternoon to all. I'll be presenting on the topic, an atypical presentation of post cesarean section complication. I'm Dr. Divya, who's a graduate student. Uh, my patient, uh, Aarti, was a 29-year-old female homemaker, resident of Noida. She was referred to ESI Basai Darapur on post-operative day six of LSCS which was done at a private hospital in view of previous uh, preterm LSCS with scar tenderness. She was referred to us from ESI Jilmil in view of urosepsis with right renal calculi, with right hydronephrosis, with cholecystitis and cholelithiasis, and history of post-operative hematuria to be managed in a tertiary care center. She presented to us with a chief complaint of pain abdomen along with distension since post-operative day two. She also had fever for one day and she gives history of hematuria in the immediate post-op period, which gradually resolved after two to three days. She had pain abdomen, which was in the lower abdomen. It was a continuous dull aching pain, radiating to back and flank. There were no aggravating factors, and it was relieved occasionally by IV analgesics. It was associated with gradual distension of abdomen. She also had fever of 100, and, since post-operative day five, she had fever of 101 degree Fahrenheit. It was continuous and, uh, and was associated with chills and rigor. She also has history of uh, hematuria when uh, it was first noticed immediately post-operative period, which gradually resolved after the three days. There was no associated bleeding per vagina or bleeding from any other side, no associated nausea or vomiting or burning micturition. There was no history of hematuria pre-operatively or there was no history of any raised blood pressure records. Patient had passed stool and flatus in the post-operative period. Her obstetric history, her first, she, she was, she's a para to life too, married since uh, five years. Her first child uh, was, is a boy baby weighing 2.3 kg, uh, delivered by preterm LSCS three years back in view of severe oligo. The antipartum baby is alive and healthy and the antipartum and postpartum period was uneventful. Her second child also delivered by an emergency LSCS on 7 January 2020 at a private hospital in view of previous preterm LSCS with scar tenderness. Uh, she delivered a baby boy uh, who's alive and healthy and baby weight was three kg. However, in the immediate post-op period, she okay. started having a dull aching pain and uh, associated with post-op hematuria and fever. Uh, in private okay. hospital, as per the records, uh, she received a three P PRBC and three FFP yeah. due to the falling hemoglobin. Her hemoglobin on day one was 13, which uh, reduced to 5.3 gram per deciliter on day four, for which she received uh, blood and FFP. Also, her INR and kidney function tests were found to be deranged. And a uh, USG ultrasound whole abdomen and pelvis was done, which was suggestive of uh, right hydronephrosis with right ureteric calculus, chronic cholecystitis and cholelithiasis with bulky uterus, but there was no intra-abdominal collection, which was visible. So she was uh, referred to ESI Jilmil from the private hospital, where she underwent a general examination and was quickly transferred to ESI Basai Darapur. In our hospital, she was first received in the surgery casualty 
because of the above complaint she has history of renal calculi and hydronephrosis and hematuria so as as she visited the surgery casualty her catheter was changed and bladder irrigation uh, done the moment bladder irrigation was started it revealed a gross hematuria and since uh, she was on post operative day 6 of lscs gynecological opinion was sought her other history menstrual contraceptive personal and family history were not significant her, in past history she had history of renal calculi for which uh, she was on some ayurvedic medications when we examined the patient she was conscious uh, but sick looking febrile to touch temperature of 100 degree fahrenheit her pulse rate was 120 per minute spo2 was 96% on room air blood pressure of 90 by 60 mm of mercury she was clinically pale six, uh, of 6 to 7 g per dl and there was bilateral pedal edema present there was no sinuses clubbing or lymphadenopathy her bilateral breasts were engorged patient was catheterized and there was 300 cc of hematuria present in the uro bag on abdominal examination the umbilicus was central and inverted there was mild distension visible in the hypogastrium however there was no bleeding or discharge from the suture site no other scar marks or visible pulsations were seen and all hernia sites were normal Uh, when the abdomen was palpated it was this found to be distended it was febrile to touch tenderness was elicited in the hypogastrium and both iliac fossa the fundus of the uterus was infraumbilical and was deviated slightly towards the right there was a diffuse lower abdominal mass of approximately 8 into 6 cm in the hypogastrium extending towards the left iliac fossa and towards the lumbar region it was an ill defined mass of firm cons- consistency consistency it had restricted mobility and the lower margins of the mass could not be defined on percussion over the mass it gave a dull note however no shifting dullness was present bowel sounds were sluggish on local examination lokia was healthy and there was no bleeding per vagina on um, per vaginal examination also there was no active bleeding uterus was well contracted to 20 week size her other systemic examination was also unremarkable hence a di- provisional diagnosis uh, was made a 29 year old female para to life to on day 6 of emergency lscs with diffuse abdomino pelvic mass a uh, post with most likely post operative hematoma in sepsis with hematuria with severe anemia not in failure so uh, after admitting we established a venous line and iv fluids were given uh, and her emergency investigations were sent her hemoglobin was found to be 6.2 and her kidney function test uh, was slightly deranged and inr was 1.96 <laughs> then after that uh, she, patient was stabilized iv tranexamic acid was given injection vitamin k was uh, given to the patient blood products were arranged two prb two a uh, prbc and 4 ffp were transfused to the patient and she was kept under strict vitals uh, monitoring and input output charting her repeat blood investigations revealed a hemoglobin of 6.8 g per dl and inr had uh, reduced to 1.36 then a uh, ultrasound whole abdomen and pelvis was done urgently which revealed an organized heterogeneous collection of 10 into 10 cm in uh, with minimal free fluid and then a usg guided paracentesis was done which was negative since the ultrasound report was inconclusive we went for an mri abdomen and pelvis in M- mri abdomen and pelvis there was a retroperitoneal hematoma of 11 into 10 cm and there was no further comment on any other organ injury and there was moderate free fluid in the pouch of douglas so uh, being post operative day 6 of lscs with large retroperitoneal hematoma and the patient was hemodynamically unstable with severe anemia with hematuria she was planned for an emergency exploratory laparotomy so with a multidisciplinary approach the senior anesthetist gynecologist and surgeons were involved and with adequate blood products we uh, took her for exploratory laparotomy her abdomen was opened by midline vertical incision and uh, when the abdomen was opened there was a blood mixed straw colored fluid in the pelvis which was suction and uh, to our surprise the uterus uh, was completely normal there was no bleeder visualized the shining posterior surface of the bladder and the dome were visualized stretched over the anterior surface of the uterus on further exploration it was found that the anterior wall of the bladder was totally deficient the lateral walls of the bladder were cicatrized and foley's bulk was seen in the pelvis so then the urologist was immediately called in and uh, on the posterior surface of the bladder there was a seven shaped laceration of 4 into 8 cm extending between the two ureteric orifices in the region of the trigone and also a retroperitoneal hematoma of 8 into 8 cm was present so the first thing we uh, we did was a uh, dg stenting was done of the ureters uh, we could only do the stenting of the left ureter and the re- right ureter could not be stented because of an impacted ureteric calculus uh, in the right ureter 
and there was a retroperitoneal hematoma of 1000 cc which was evacuated in bits and asking the anesthetist to keep a strict watch on the vitals. There was no active bleeder in the retroperitoneal area and fibrin glue was instilled in that area and laceration of the posterior wall was repaired. Bladder was reconstructed and margins were freshened and mobilized. Then suprapubic cystotomy done, bladder was closed in two layers, a white watertight closure was ensured and three ways Foley's catheter was inserted. Two drain were also put, one in the retropubic space and one posterior to the bladder. After completion of the procedure, the patient was shifted to ICU and strict uh, monitoring of the vitals and input output done. In the post-op period, slow irrigation of the bladder, continuous irrigation of the bladder was done with normal saline and urine routine microscopy was done every third day. She was also kept on IV antibiotics. So in the post-op period, after two weeks, we uh, did an intravenous pylogram and it revealed uh, no leakage. However, the uh, urinary bladder was found to be slightly distended. Also, a cystogram was done after uh, four, at four weeks uh, post-op period, and it revealed a normal bladder outline, and there was no extra vessation of the dye visual, visualized. Uh, cystoscopy was planned at six weeks after removing the perurethral uh, catheter. And uh, in that, uh, during the cystoscopy, the DJ's tent, the left-sided DJ's tent was uh, removed, uh, and uh, the ureteric orifices were visualized. The, it, they were normal. Urine jet was also seen through the two ureteric orifices. Bladder walls had healed uh, adequately and there were no diverticulum or rent. And uh, the suprapubic catheter was clamped and the patient was asked to uh, void, encouraged to void. She voided after seven to eight hours of clamping the suprapubic catheter, which was finally removed after one week. So, and at five months of uh, follow-up, we did a non-contrast CT scan of the kidney ureter bladder and as we can see here in this uh, CT scan, it showed a distended urinary bladder with normal wall thickness. There was no uh, focal defect, diverticular, or surrounding fluid collection. And the patient is still in follow-up with us, and she has no fresh urinary con uh, complaints. So uh, I would like to conclude that there should be a high index of suspicion for retroperitoneal hematomas as well in uh, gradually deteriorating cases of post-delivery in both cesarean section as well as uh, normal delivery. And now I call upon Dr. Priyanka Mathema for the discussion for this case. Thank you. Retroperitoneal hematomas. The incidence of these are still unknown in obstetrics. Very limited data is available till date. The etiology being mainly the spontaneous rupture of art arterial aneurysm and the maximum cases which have been reported till date are the, either the splenic artery aneurysm or the renal artery aneurysm. Another etiological factor can be mechanical injury to the major blood vessels of the pelvis. Apart from ruptured aneurysm, another etiology can be patients on anticoagulation therapies, patients with obstetric coagulopathies, especially the patients with hypertensive disorders complicated with thrombocytopenia, DIC, HEL, acute fatty liver of pregnancy, and hepatic rupture. There is a very interesting case, which is the single case reported till date of a obstetric patient who was 27 weeks uh, period of gestation who was IVF conceived with hepatic rupture with large retroperitoneal hematoma, and she was found to be diagnosed with peliosis hepatitis. This is an uncommon vascular condition, which is characterized by multiple blood fill cysts and cavities throughout the liver. Evidences show that due to increased steroid hormones in pregnancy, the elastic layer of blood vessels can undergo some sort of fibroplasia, which can further lead to weakening of vessels and aneurysm. And pregnant females are at more risk of rupture of these aneurysms. The patient can present to us in acute or subacute condition and also up to four weeks postnatally. The signs can be tachycardia, hypotension, abdominal pain, Epigastric pain, vaginal or rectal pain, culling sign can be seen, which is the bruising around the umbilicus, or the gray turner sign, which is the blackest discoloration of the flanks, which may which can be even noticed if after one to two days of formation of these hematomas. In gradually developing cases, it is difficult to diagnose. Uh, uh, diagnose these cases and it may manifest only after significant amount of blood loss, which has already been taken place. Ultrasonography is the first line of uh, investigation. It may detect the, these hematomas, but is not very precise. The CT scan is highly sensitive in these cases, uh, although CT angiography can even relieve, reveal the exact site of bleeding. Apart from this, that, we can also go for an MRI. 
Till date, there is no data of retroperitoneal hematoma with bladder injury post cesarean section reported. Uh, the initial line of management is always patient stabilization, fluid resuscitation, blood transfusion, and reversal of the coagulopathies. Now, whether to go for operative or non-operative management depends upon the etiology of these hematomas, size and extent of the hematomas, hemodynamic status of the patient, and the fetus status. Uh, according to the site of hematomas, the abdominal cavity is divided into three zones. Whenever these hematomas lie in zone one, it always mandates exploration because of high likelihood of major vascular injuries. While when the hematomas lie in zone three or two, which was seen as in our patient, requires exploration if the patient is hemodynamically unstable. Whereas in non-expanding hematomas without pressure symptoms, one can opt for conservative approach. Alternate to the surgery can be vascular, vascular embolization, which is an alternative, but depending upon the hemodynamic stability of the patient, availability of the facility, and the degree of blood loss. Thus, a high index of suspicion in gradually deteriorating cases of whether it being a normal delivery or operative delivery or cesarean section, especially complicated with hypertensive disorders of pregnancies, coagulopathies of obstetrics, adherent placenta should be kept in mind. These hematomas are rare with dreadful complication and can uh, and are different from commonly seen pelvic hematomas and thus demand more awareness among obstetricians. Also, existing guidelines need to include these hematomas as an important cause of maternal collapse and maternal morbidity. The incidence of bladder injuries during cesarean section ranges from 0 0.08 to 0.94%. The risk, factor, risk factors which contribute to these injuries are increasing number of cesarean sections, cesarean section done in, which are emergency cesarean sections, cesarean sections done in advanced labor, in cases of distorted local anatomy, in cases of cesarean hysterectomies, even the higher incidence of bladder uh, trauma is seen which uh, hikes up to 11.7%. Pregnancies with scarred uterus, suspected intra-abdominal adhesions. The ramifications can be prolonged operative time, urinary tract infection, prolonged catheterization, formation of vesicouterine or vesicle vaginal fistulas, adding up emotional distress to the patients. So it is always better to anticipate these type of injuries and to take precautionary measures like in cases of dense sedation, one should go for sharp dissection for adhesiolysis and bladder separation. In cases of cord prolapse, one should not forget to drain the bladder before putting an incision. In cases of morbidly adherent placenta, filling up of the bladder with 200 to 300 of ml of normal saline prior to cesarean section would reduce bladder injury. This is supported by these two studies in which the cytoinflation with saline was done prior to the surgery. In the first study, uh, the bladder filling was done before uh, in cases of accreta surgeries, while in the second study, the cytoinflation was done in cases of elective cesarean section found to have dense pelvic adhesion. And in both these studies, uh, a significantly lesser amount of bladder injuries were noticed along with lesser amount of blood loss. So it is very crucial to diagnose and manage these injuries during the surgery itself so as to minimize complications and morbidity, which is the best prognostic factor. The most common site of bladder injuries during cesarean section is the dome of the bladder, and which occurs maximum during the creation of the bladder flap. American Association of Surgery of Trauma divides this injury into five grades. Grade five is the most severe form of injury, which involves either the trigone or the bladder neck, which was also seen in our patient. Intraoperative findings can be extravasation of urine, appearance of Foley's bulb, gross hematuria and urobag, visible detrusion muscle laceration, and positive methylene blue dye test. After diagnosing the injury, one should always examine the site of the injury, whether the trigone is involved or not, extent of the injury, and its relationship to the ureters. The repair is done in two layers with polyglycolic acid uh, sutures, ensuring a watertight closure, followed by a dual catheterization with suprapubic cystotomy and a transurethral catheter. These catheters are usually kept for 10 to 14 days. SPC is removed after 7 to 10 days and transurethral catheter can be removed after 14 days. It is very important to check for urine culture sensitivity every third day under broad spectrum antibiotic coverage. 
few medical legal points i like to discuss here whenever the bladder injury is as a consequence of post operative addition or abnormal anatomy or in cases of ad advanced labor this can be defendable and cannot be proven as negligence although if in absence of abnormal anatomy bladder injury may invite penalty if the injury is not recognized intraoperatively it may also be proven as negligent so to avoid medical legal issues this it is better to discuss the possibilities of these type of injuries during cesarean section of the vulnerable patient during the counseling itself and to maintain a written, doc written documentation of this thank thank you for the patient hearing now i would like to call dr shreya to present the next case a very good afternoon to all ma'am i'll be presenting a case on postpartum eclampsia with posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome in pregnancy a true near miss case a 29 year old primary gravida with 33 plus 4 weeks period of gestation referred from esi noida in view of non availability of blood bank and nicu facility presented to a gynae casualty with chief complaints of headache for two days difficulty in breathing for one day and decreased fetal movement for 3 to 4 hours she gave no history of fever burning maturation leaking or bleeding per vagina she was a registered case of esi noida with one antenatal visit there and was lost to follow up thereafter she was moderately anemic in her antenatal period whereas the rest of the antenatal investigations were unremarkable on examination her general condition was poor bp was recorded to be 200 by 120 mm of mercury pallor and pedal edema were present and on auscultation of the fetal heart sounds the fhs was 110 dipping to 100 we sent urgent investigations and her tlc count was found to be raised and urine albumin was plus 2 we made a provisional diagnosis of a primary gravida at 33 plus 4 weeks period of gestation with severe preeclampsia septicemia moderate anemia with fetal distress we stabilized the patient with a loading dose of magnesium sulfate as per the pritchard regimen and gave her injectable labetalol 20 plus 40 mg and a repeat bp was taken 15 minutes later it was found to be 180 by 100 we repeated a dose of labetalol 40 mg and over the next 30 minutes her bp reduced to 150 98 we stabilized the patient and shifted her for a emergency cesarean section in view of severe preeclampsia with fetal distress it was done under spinal anesthesia and there was no intra op pph she delivered a very low birth baby girl who was handed to the pediatrician and shifted to nursery for urgent resuscitation she maintained intra op normal bp records we shifted the patient to icu in the post op period on iv antibiotics spiptaz and clindamycin with medical consultation keeping in view her raised tlc count <coughs> On post-op day one in the ICU, she had three episodes of generalized tonic-clonic seizures while on magnesium sulfate, which aborted spontaneously. We thereafter put the patient on IV anti-epileptics Levera and Phenytoin, and the magnesium sulfate maintenance doses were continued. Patient was intubated for airway protection in view of a prolonged postictal phase, and rigorous invasive BP monitoring was done via a right radial arterial line. The hypertensive emergency was managed with labetalol and NTG infusion, which was titrated according to her BP records. Investigation trends here show from post-op day one to four, there was worsening of the leukocytosis and thrombocytopenia. Progressive derangements were seen in her renal function test, as well as a fall in the total protein counts were seen. The serum lactate levels were also found to be high. The patient also complained of blurring of vision with mydriasis. with medicine nephrology and ophthalmology consultation we decided the further course of management of the patient and sent pan cultures including a blood et tube and high vaginal swab culture and sensitivity we also ordered a ncct head to look for any post ictal neurological deficits the blood and et tube aspirate came positive for enterococcus which was sensitive to ticoplanin linozolid vancomycin clindamycin and doxycycline however the high vaginal swab had candidal growth culture and sensitivity specific iv antibiotics were upgraded with medical consultation to linozolid and oral doxycycline and clindamycin was continued as previously The NCCT head was suggestive of vasogenic edema in the bilateral frontal, left temporoparietal lobes, suggestive of early press changes. 
we started the patient on hyperosmolar agents injection mannitol and dexamethasone with medical consultation to address the pupillary dilation the patient underwent a fundoscopic examination which was found to be suggestive of grade 2 3 papilledema with hypertensive retinopathic changes the patient was thereafter put on a weekly follow up fundoscopy to see for progressive retinal changes we started the patient on human albumin to address the total falling protein levels and patient was extubated on post op day 7 and was thereafter maintaining 100% oxygen saturation on 4 to 5 liters of oxygen by mass we transfused the patient with one packed red blood cells on post op day 7 on examination the patient was conscious and oriented her vitals were stable and despite derangement seen in her renal function test she was maintaining a normal urine output however pallor was present on examination of the sensory and autonomic systems it was found to be intact however the motor examination showed reduced power bilaterally in the lower limbs the tone was reduced in bilateral lower limb and so was the deep tendon reflexes investigation trends from post op day 6 to 10 showed a progressive rise in the hemoglobin level post transfusion on post op day 7 however there was persistent leukocytosis ranging to a level of 20 40 2000 there was progressive improvement seen in the renal function test and the total protein levels serum lactates were found to show a decrease in trend the mri brain further confirmed the diagnosis of press syndrome a confirmative diagnosis of postpartum eclampsia with early press syndrome severe anemia and sepsis was made the patient from post op day 7 to 10 developed new onset spikes of fever blood investigations to rule out the cause of fever were sent we ordered a chest x ray and a targeted ultrasound scan was done we repeated covid-19 rt pcr test which came out to be negative keeping in view the persistent leukocytosis and the new onset fever spikes and upgradation of iv antibiotic with medical consultation to vancomycin was done on post op day 8 the imaging findings were suggestive of lower respiratory tract infection with synomonic effusion following a change of antibiotic to iv vancomycin the patient showed a dramatic improvement from post op day 11 to 15 showing a fall in the total leukocyte count to 17000 there were improvements seen in the renal function test as well as the nutrition status of the patient serum lactate levels were on normalizing trends improvement was seen in the power and tone of bilateral lower limbs a review fundoscopic examination showed dramatic improvement with resolution of the blurring of vision and patient was successfully discharged by us on post op day 18 a six weekly follow up of the patient the she was found to be doing well and was in true case a near miss case which was successfully managed by our institution thank you ma'am i would like to call dr divya uh, assistant professor for the further discussion of this case good afternoon everyone i would like to discuss our case peripartum eclampsia with press syndrome in pregnancy what journal you miss a woman who survives life threatening conditions during pregnancy abortion and childbirth or within 42 days of pregnancy termination irrespective of receiving emergency medical or surgical intervention is called maternal miss why near miss is important near miss cases are more common than maternal death the major costs are the same for both near miss and mortality investigating the instances of severe morbidity may be less threatening to providers because the women survived one can learn from the patients themselves since they survived and are available for interview about the care they received opportunities to improve the quality of health care is there The most common causes of maternal near miss are hemorrhage, hypertensive disorders, sepsis, and obstructive labor. The diagnosis of our patient was postpartum eclampsia with press, with moderate anemia, with septicemia. For diagnosis of near miss, the patient should meet minimum three criteria: one, each from clinical findings, investigations, or from intervention, or any single criteria which signifies a cardiorespiratory collapse, as indicated with this heart symbol. in our patient as she had hypertension she had bp more than 160 110 had convulsions had diminution of blurring of vision had cerebral hemorrhage on ct scan or if we take a single heart criteria icu admission was there 
with sepsis patient had high grade fever altered consciousness persistent rise in temperature her she had tachycardia she had persistent leukocytosis which increased up to 42000 she also has icu admission for the same and she was intubated for 7 days posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome it is first described by hinche et al in 1996 press is a rare serious clinical neuroradiological entity it is characterized by milieu of seizure activity headache nausea vomiting visual disturbances blurred vision hemianopia visual neglect and cortical blindness altered mental state impaired consciousness and focal neurological signs <laughs> Seizures usually present as generalized seizure. These symptoms can be acute and may occur gradually in few days. Some patients show decrease or asymmetrical limb muscle strength, while tendon reflexes are usually active. Press can be associated with number of condition, all of which result in cerebrovasogenic edema, which seem to be the crucial pathogenic mechanism. Press is a reversible neurological entity characterized by the presence of white matter edema affecting the occipital and parietal lobe. it is typically reversible once the underlying cause is removed the exact incidence of press is unknown it can occur at any age and most commonly affect females this probably reflects the fact that one of the most common causes of press is preeclampsia eclampsia developing during pregnancy other common conditions that are associated with press are hypertensive emergencies renal diseases patient on immunosuppressive agents like cyclosporin tacrolimus sepsis has been found to be of one of the commonest cause autoimmune disease such as sle systemic sclerosis tumulus syndrome gulen barre syndrome aids thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura acute intermittent porphyria press in association with late postpartum eclampsia has been reported before the pathophysiology of press two theories had been advocated the more popular theory is hypertension which leads to failure of autoregulation then subsequent hyperperfusion and then vasogenic edema the other theory is vasoconstriction and hypoperfusion leads to brain ischemia and subsequent vasogenic edema the pathogenesis of preeclampsia that leads to this is role of placenta in preeclampsia is clearly defined formation of placenta then placental ischemia which caused more syncytial surface tissue apoptosis and necrosis and dropping off together with activated t helper cells release large amount of inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor interleukins interleu interferon causing severe maternal systemic immune response leading to systemic endothelial cell activation and injury activated endothelial cells secrete large amount of inflammatory mediators and vasoconstrictive substances it induced diffuse systemic vascular contraction and then caused brain vasogenic edema the occurrence of preeclampsia postpartum placental fragments residue is likely one of the causes endothelial cell injury can also cause platelet adhesion hemolysis and protein in body fluid extravasation Severe cases can have thrombocytopenia, elevated LDH, abnormal red blood cell morphology, and generalized edema. Glomerular endothelial dysfunction can cause loss of electrolytes, fluids, and proteins, leading to water and electrolyte imbalance and hypoproteinemia. Clinically, red blood cell morphology and LDH levels are usually used as the indicator of endothelial injury. Cerebrospinal fluid is usually normal, though mildly elevated protein has been occasionally reported. The differential diagnoses of press are cerebral venous thrombosis, stroke, meningoencephalitis, demyelinating lesions of the brain. Early imaging is crucial. MRI is the main modality of choice. MRI findings of press is characterized by high signal intensity on T2 weight and flare images predominantly in the posterior regions. It is caused by subcortical white matter vasogenic edema. Atypical features have been seen in neuroimaging like significant anterior cortical brain stem lesions. The treatment is of the primary disease, control of neurological symptoms, and hypertension. For preeclampsia, eclampsia induced press, the key treatment is controlled hypertension. The drug of choice is magnesium sulfate. For treatment of epileptic seizures, an intravenous load do loading dose is administered initially, followed by continuous maintenance dose infusion. Other drugs include with magnesium sulfate, but with diazepam, phenytoin, or lytic cocktail. Other treatment which are used for treatment are diuretic agents and corticosteroids such as dexamethasone or betamethasone. Mm -hmm. complications pulmonary edema dic aspiration pneumonia permanent neurological deficit encrolopathy and death the review of literature of press showed nine studies there are few more studies as well in which it was seen anti epileptics and anti hypertensive was the treatment of choice all the patients had icu admission but timely treatment and proper intervention causes the full remission of patients in most of them there's a acog guidelines which Uh, gives us the management of sepsis in pregnancy 
and it recommends the empirical broad spectrum antibiotic to be administered as soon as the within one hour of the diagnosis of sepsis we rec they recommend obtaining cultures blood urinary respiratory as indicated and serum lactate levels to be monitored as it was done in our patient the what is the role of fluid therapy in management of sepsis fluid resuscitation should be a part of initial intervention if hypotension or hypoperfusion is present fever veno dilation and capillary leakage all lead to inadequate preload in the patient with sepsis the surviving sepsis campaign recommends an initial bolus of 30 ml per kg of crystalloid but this recommendation may be overly aggressive in pregnancy in which colloid and cortic pressure is lower and the risk of pulmonary edema is higher and more in our patient because eclemptic patients have higher tendency to develop pulmonary edema so fluid resuscitation has to be done in a very vigilant manner restricting the fluid to be 60 ml per hour press in association with sepsis has been seen infection sepsis shock may be an important cause of press particularly in relation to infection with gram positive organism as shown in this original research by mr barton say in it it was shown in 23 patients significant infection and bacteremia occurred in close association with development of press it was seen that the community acquired and nosocomial sources like staph aureus coagulus negative staphylococci and enterococci accounting for 30 to 50% of our cases as seen in our patient also conclusion near miss mortality is a better indicator of studying the quality of care than mortality aur hai ki aaj pehli bar aisa ho raha hai ki mere pe na signal on off ho raha hai and main chat bhi nahi pad pa rahi hu aaj mere who criteria universally recommend most common but not exclusive causes are hemorrhage hypertensive disorder and infection press is reversible but after appropriate treatment it which makes it important to recognize and treat the etiology this case demonstrate that early treatment with control of blood pressure can reverse this condition and prevent progression to eclampsia thus emphasizing the need for early diagnosis and treatment sepsis with press should be vigilantly monitored thank you so much and a very happy new year i would like to invite dr jyoti for the next case all i am presenting a, a case of extra hepatic portal vein obstruction in a full term pregnant woman under guidance of dr leena vadwa professor and dr sanjana vadwa assistant professor primary gravida at 24 week of just at 24 year old 38 week of gestation referred to esi basai darapur in view of derange elapti on 23rd of october 2020 with chief complaint of amenorrhea since 9 month and history of vomiting on and off since 1 month her last menstrual period was on 1st of february 2020 with a previous regular menstrual cycle she was she is married for 2 year primary with a spontaneous conception at 16 week of gestation she presented with a history of nausea and vomiting for which she was admitted and diagnosed with acute viral hepatitis a during this period her other viral markers were negative her liver enzyme was deranged in range of 300 to 400 and she was lost to follow up after this again at 34 week of gestation she presented with history of vomiting for which she was investigated again her liver function test were deranged her viral markers were negative she was not relieved and was referred to us she has no history of fever itching pain abdomen trauma or any bleeding disorder blood transfusion there was no history of underlying liver disease no history of bleeding disorder and thrombophilia in family on admission she was conscious oriented to time place and person she was hemodynamically stable her systemic examinations were within normal limit on per abdominal examination her overlying skin was normal there were no spider nevi or petechi uterus was strong size cephalic relaxed on auscultation fetal heart sound was present regular 144 beat per minute there was no alcoholemia and she was not in labor Here are her laboratory finding. The first two columns represent her lab finding at 16 to 18 week of gestation, where her hemogram, ERK, and coagulation profile were within normal limit. Her LFT was deranged, with ALT and AST ranging between 240 to 400. And then she was lost to follow up again at 34 week of gestation. Her uh, hemogram was normal. Her coagulation profiles were normal. Her liver function was deranged. Again, in range of 300 to 400, and she was referred to us at 34 week of gestation when she has another episode of vomiting. Her other viral her viral marker screening were negative. Bile acid and lipid profile were within normal limit. 
she had her uh, serial ultrasound scan done which was corresponding to age gca was ruled out and on uh, on admission a uh, fetal well being scan was done which was corresponding to gestational age since her liver function test was deranged persistently we proceeded with ultrasound whole abdomen which showed a few collateral channel which was seen at quarter replacing the main portal vein which was suggestive of portal cavernoma with mild splenomegaly we confirmed the diagnosis <laughs> with by color doctor okay uh, now what are the differential diagnosis Uh, her serum bile acid was normal there was no pruritus so we ruled out the intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy she was normotensive thromb there was no uh, thrombocytopenia no evidence of hemolysis so we ruled out help there was uh, her lipid profile was normal sensory criteria was not fulfilled so acute fatty liver of pregnancy was ruled out her leukocytes were within normal range so any uh, foci of inflammation was ruled out and infection was ruled out I would request Dr. Sanjana Vadva, Assistant Professor, to uh, come for further discussion. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti. Since uh, this patient has uh, the final diagnosis of this patient comes out to be 24-year-old primary gravida, 38 weeks of gestation, with portal cavernoma. So, what is portal cavernoma? It is the cavernomatous transformation of portal vein, which is a consequence of chronic portal vein thrombosis, which leads to development of collateral channels, which bypass this occlusion. These cavernomas can be identified as soon as 15 to 30 days after the onset of abdominal symptoms. And the incidence of its uh, portal cavernoma complicating pregnancy. as per the case report of 2013 portal cavernoma during pregnancy the exact incidence of portal cavernoma is not yet known but the incidence of variceal bleeding occurring in non cirrhotic portal hypertension patient ranges from 20 to 40% in multicentric studies to an incidence of 34% in prospective retrospective analysis the clinical manifestations of uh, of these patients portal cavernoma can be very still bleeding which is the most common presentation can be uh, accompanied by splenomegaly fever thrombocytopenia anemia pain abdomen jaundice uh, pain abdomen jaundice fetal growth restriction or it could be completely asymptomatic like in our case the question comes to us now a primary 38 weeks portal cavernoma what should be the plan a normal vaginal delivery or an elective cesarean section reviewing the literature we uh, found that the cesarean delivery is reserved only for obstetrical indications the delivery should be monitored closely second stage of labor should be cut short by operative vaginal delivery in the patients who are at risk further reviewing the literature we found the evidence that the labor and the vaginal delivery is a preferred mode of termination of these pregnancies a passive second stage of labor is advisable to avoid any intra abdominal and variceal pressure increase if abdominal wall varices are cut during cesarean delivery there is a risk of excessive bleeding thrombocytopenia further complicates the surgical bleeding thus cesarean section should be avoided in these cases the next question was what about anticoagulants should we start them reviewing the literature we found the role of anticoagulant in these patients is not yet clear the only documented indication is any previous prothrombotic disorder in these patients so keep it, what were the complications we could uh, dissipate for while make the, handling this patient were disease associated complications or obstetrical complications disease related complications like variceal bleeding portal hypertension blood product transfusion preeclampsia stillbirths meconium stain lichen operative delivery and cesarean section the most feared complication was is variceal bleeding which leads to maternal morbidity and mortality these were the complications we were anticipating but the condition portal cavernoma has been seen to co complicate even in postnatal period thus postpartum hemorrhage ascites pleural effusion are the common postnatal complications which can occur in our case keeping these complications in mind we planned a normal vaginal delivery for the patient under the restricted iv fluid to prevent the third space over excessive load of the fluid under the gastroenterologist consultation Stri uh, we strict fetal heart monitoring vital charting was done 
the patient was uh, taken up for normal delivery. Vacuum assisted vaginal delivery was done on 24th of October, 2020. We actively managed that third stage of labor of the patient by giving mesoprost, tranexa, prophylactic balloon tamponade was kept ready, but the patient's uterus were contracted well. There is another case report which supports the postnatal complication of portal vein thrombosis in the portal cavernoma. This is a report from Japan, 2017, in which the patient had cesarean and post of day one, she developed acute transient abdominal pain. Ultrasound done revealed portal cavernoma. Patient was started on anticoagulant therapy, close monitoring was done, and patient was managed successfully. We did ultrasound and liver function test on day three of postnatal and the mother and baby were discharged with their advice to follow up postpartum six weeks with liver function test and coagulation report. Patient reported to us on 18th of December, 2020. She's doing good. Her ultrasound and investigations were repeated. The ultrasound shows persistent portal cavernoma, hemogram normal, bile, serum bile, bilirubin normal, but her liver enzymes are still moderately raised. Her viral marker, APLA and coagulation were also within our negative. The prognosis of these conditions carry better are better than the patients who have this onset uh, under or underlying cause of liver cirrhosis. There's a case report from uh, 2013 in which they had a 13 weeks antenatal patient reporting to them. She was also clinically asymptomatic like in our case with no sign and symptoms of any hyperspinism or portal cholangiopathy. She was hemodynamically stable with negative medical history for liver disease. The liver function tests were, were normal except the moderately high level of transaminases, like in our case. They also, uh, this patient had got a GCS scan done and first trimester and they terminated it with a portal cavernoma. The study also highlights that these patients, these, these conditions occur more frequently in patients without underlying liver disease. And if the condition occurs on the uh, background of cirrhosis, the prognosis is poor. There's another case report of 2013 in which the portal cavernoma was diagnosed in uh, asymptomatic non-serotic pa uh, patient, which got complicated by preeclampsia in the later pregnancy. The patient was taken up for cesarean section. There was ascites in drop and postoperatively patient also developed ascites. She was managed with uh, the anticoagulants and she uh, was discharged healthy. There's another case study on these extra hepatic portal vein obstruction in pregnancy. They highlighted that incidence is uh, between 20 to 34% of very still bleeding in portal cavernoma patients. And these patients have good prognosis. Uh, prognosis. Thus, to conclude, variceal bleeding is the most common clinical manifestation of portal cavernoma. Prenatal correction of varices improves maternal and fetal prognosis. Fertility remains normal in portal cavernoma cases. Pregnancies can be allowed and managed successfully under close supervision of obstetrician and gastroenterologist. The management of portal hypertension in pregnancy is same as non-pregnant. So surgical interventions like endoscopic sclerotherapy, endosp endoscopic variceal ligations, banding, shunt surgeries can be performed during second trimester. Caesarean should only, only be reserved for obstetrical indications. Thus, the doctor and pregnant patients are on the same page. We are the partners in delivering a healthy baby, a healthy mother, dedicated to a safe mother to her. A very wish you a very happy new year from ASI Baseda. Yes, ma'am, sir. The judges can ask the questions. Yeah, yeah. May I ask the question once the first person, the first case? Yes, I just yes. Ask whether there was any uh, effort made to obtain the surgical. 27% uh, This patient. Ma'am, the question is not clear. Uh, whether the surgical operative notes were obtained for this patient or not, because the, those were very relevant. Ma'am, we had talked to them, the uh, referring center, telephonically, okay. and uh, basically they had not diagnosed it. They had missed it. It was a simple cesarean as per them. Okay. And uh, um, post-operatively, the patient had hematuria, but on day two and day three, she had resolved because uh, the actually uh, um, the bladder was posterior wall was exposed, and because of hematoma, it was bulging, and uh, it made a pseudo cavity. It made a false yeah, cavity. Yeah, that. that is why it was not the urine was not in the entire abdominal cavity, and the catheter was very close to ureteric orifices. Yeah, fine. So the urine was clear. Taru. Yes, madam. Taru. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, there was also an ultrasound report of day three, which showed a, uh, you know, bulky uterus. 
Yeah. Because when you uh, got a patient, it was a twin. It was uh, you know, Divya said that it is a twenty okay. weeks gravid uterus. Yes, yes, yes. But yes, there yes. was, I, if I am correct, that uh, there was a you know ultrasound report of a bulky mm. uterus also. I think uh, yes, from there, yes, uh, yeah, from uh, there only from the uterus, the mm. ultrasound was in the private they sector did, only. Yes, they did mention. Yeah. They did not mention about any intra-abdominal yes. collection. Okay. And this was a report which with with which the patient so had come to us. Actually, it was a you know bladder injury which has yes. you know precipitated the whole thing. Yes. It was a bladder, was bladder injury. Huh, yeah, ma'am. This was basically a bladder, a huge bladder That's laceration. The, yeah. It was a grade five. Was a grade five injury involving the trigone as well. And there was no documentation of the no, you know no, 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 notes no, and all no, that. Ma'am, that's why the whole of the time was uh, taken up just because to make a uh, proper yeah. diagnosis of the patient. Just that because. shows the importance, you know, especially the cerebral notes and all that. They were and missing. And the intraperitoneal hematoma was also a surprise for us. Yeah. When it came in, uh, MRI. Not when the, the series of events occurred yes. because of the, you know, the initial injury which occurred during the laparotomy. And, and the such surgery. a huge injury. Such a huge injury. Yeah. yeah. Very huge injury. Maybe it was and injured must... the first uh, cesarean. Yeah. And after that, maybe it just healed with a small scar. And later on in this cesarean, because yeah. that was a preterm cesarean, you know. So, yeah. yeah. But Agreed. the patient had a seven-shaped rent in the posterior wall also. And mm -hmm. the wall of the bladder, no? That yeah. is something what they do is, if the bladder is adherent no? and you push with the um, with blunt force, it can just cause a tear. Yes, yeah. yes. It's important not to, in previously scarred uterus and uh, scarred this thing, not to push the bladder forcefully. No, it should be with the section of the section. Yeah, things cause causing the injury is not all that. I mean, yes, that's to it. diagnose and to manage is more yeah, important. Diagnosis was missing. Yes. That was the you know that is the important. whole thing. Yeah. Plus, they took very much time. Talu, about the six about days the second that. case. Talu? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Divya, uh, what was the cause of such a, you know, it was a plan, so there uh, and I think, and uh, the, no, actually the patient was referred to us from ESI Noida. So, uh, since uh, she was referred, the day she was admitted with us, the same day her TLC was 22,000, ma'am. Okay. So it could be a hospital acquired thing that as she was admitted for three, four days and then she was referred here. Plus, she also had anemia, ma'am. So okay. that could be a uh, okay. aggravating okay. factor for septicemia. Okay, okay. And how did you uh, go into the literature for how long can you, uh, after the, you know, delivery, uh, you can have this uh, press, you know? Generally, they have reported 48 hours after postpartum. Ma'am, a few studies have even shown uh, yeah. incidence of press even after, mostly within seven days, but one, one or two cases have been reported even up to 40 days also. A any okay, other one, one case was there other... reported at two weeks, ma'am. Okay. Any other triggering events which uh, you know, leads to this press? Ma'am, uh, prevention, though we vigilantly monitored for septicemia, but even sepsis has been found to be a cause of press, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Any uh, PPH or anything? Can ma'am, our patient did not have PPH, but yes, mm -hmm. obviously, this is also one of the commonest causes, ma'am. But our patient was uh, stood the procedure well, ma'am. She did and not. Name is coined as reversible. It is. Is it generally always reversible? Ma'am, I, uh, I had uh, took out around fourteen to sixteen studies, ma'am. In okay. that, most of them, uh, like around eighty to ninety percent patient had full remission. Only one or two patients uh, were there in which there was slight uh, weakness uh, and of bilateral limbs and all. But most of the people had full remission at uh, around after six weeks, ma'am. Uh, I would like to hear to your patient uh, also and she um, has a neurological work, ma'am. Ma'am, that was Gosh, a photograph had... of uh, I'm, I'm, I'm 42 days, ma'am. We called no her for follow-up. She has no completely recovered, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, she's all right, ma'am. She has uh, completely no remissed, ma'am. She's all right. Oh. Very well she has no neurological deficits, ma'am, at all now. Oh, I have a question uh, to ask yeah. for the first case. Yeah. The first case. Uh, so you had a retroperitoneal hematoma. This was a bladder injury. Can you think of something else uh, where one can have a retroperitoneal hematoma obstetrics? Yes. 
Along with this, we can find signs like uh, bruising around the umbilicus or the yes. around uh, in the flank area that can also point uh, towards retroperitoneal hematomas. This, this leads and to different types. Yeah. Because this is a cesarean, so one would not suspect a posterior surface injury. But otherwise, yes, this yeah. is also one of the things. Uh, one of the Another things. thing, and I sometimes a broad ligament hematoma, a broad yeah. hematoma which may not bleed. In the mm-hmm. abdomen or may not bleed vaginally, but may keep on extending from the broad ligament to the uh, retroperitoneum. So that's one more thing when you do a cesarean, one should keep in mind. So one should keep a very high, high index of suspicious suspicion mm-hmm. in particularly managing patients with Sorry. previous surgeries, or even in cases of operative deliveries. Another thing I wanted to say, Taru, that yes, very nice it should be referred, very well in time, you know. Patients are referred like she, her, your patient was referred. I think day six. Day six. Day six. Day six. Day six. Day six. Ah, you could have diagnosed it very much earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. She came to us on day six. Yes, ma'am. Mm. She came to us. On day six. I think right. because of those pre-existing calculi, they were thinking of. Attributing that hematuria probably to the renal calculus. Yeah. Yeah. After yeah. a cesarean, if hematuria appears, you should immediately start things. Yeah. From day six. This is very important. Okay, very well, brother. About the third yes. case, uh, Taru. Yes, ma'am. Any, I mean, there was no, uh, you know, and uh, before uh, pregnancy, there was no history of any because generally these cases are reported quite early in life, you know, and there was no history of yeah this uh, non uh, cirrhotic portal hypertension. The third case. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, she no. Ma'am, she had no history of any uh, problem in her previous uh, life. They are, you know, detected much uh, early in life. Yes, ma'am. There, in the case studies, they said that most of the patient can have variceal bleed or hematemesis as a presenting feature, and then they come uh, even pre-pregnancy yeah. for the consultation, and then they plan their pregnancies. But in this case, ma'am, she was completely asymptomatic. The only problem she had nausea and vomiting, which in even at sixteen to eighteen weeks, she was managed. at a periphery hospital and her liver enzymes were raised she was asked for uh, the medication but she was lost to follow up at 34 weeks when she again had same trouble she got investigated there weekly they did her uh, lft and any LFT intra- yeah any uh, intranatal factors responsible for this condition Some ma'am pregnancy people. itself is a uh, uh, cause uh, and any other source of infection as they said ki in her 16 to 18 weeks they said ki she was uh, the patient had a report showing that she is hepatitis a positive at that time but mm-hmm. her lfts were not correlating with the hepatitis but mm-hmm. uh, as per pregnancy and infection can be a co- good uh, problem matlab source of uh, infection ki we can say ki this can be caused because of it so it can so be I was, i was mentioning any events in the intranatal leading to this condition which is supposed to be an idiopathic condition you know mm-hmm. i was leading ah, to okay. that yes ma'am the omphalitis or something i read about could no. lead to such a yes, condition ma'am. yes yeah. ma'am And can you do this clerotherapy or ligation during pregnancy also yes ma'am and there has Is been physical ligation 
Yes, ma'am. There has been case reports. The patient yeah. who had uh, developed portal cavernoma on uh, already having some liver pathology. These patients, if they so have not come pre-pregnant, you are lucky that you didn't have. Yes, ma'am. We are very lucky, ma'am. There are only few case reports which are showing uh, the portal cavernoma totally asymptomatic with no underlying liver pathology. There, the British Medical Journal has reported seven cases, but all had underlying uh, liver pathology. Even in AIMS, the study which they have done on twenty-one patients, ma'am. Yeah. Out of that, twelve patients were all non uh, yeah. non cirrhotic. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so know. they have also said that if we have to intervene at any time, we the second trimester is the best time. If we yeah. have missed it pre-pregnancy, we the second trimester is the best time to intervene, and we can save the life of the patient in the pregnancy. Any role role of and uh, beta blockers, you know. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma that is the thing, ma'am. Even port for portal hypertension, the drug of choice is beta blockers. The yes. management remains the same. But as the asymptomatic patients or the patients with the non-cirrhotic portal hypertension, they generally do not uh, require beta blockers as their portal hypertension is not yet to the level which has to be. Anything mm -hmm. of portal hypertension and 10 millimeters of mercury or more, then we might have to start with uh, beta blockers, ma'am. That has to be it does done. reduce the pressure, you know. Yes, ma'am. With so these the pressures, in the we have to get a colored Oppler for portal vein, ma'am, which uh, gets us the pressure of the portal vein. If it is more than ten, we have to start with the beta blockers, ma'am. Okay. I have two two comments to make. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one is about the second case, the press syndrome. Though the name incorporates it is reversible, but now the recent literature is coming where there is up to fifty percent cases may be irreversible. Yes, yes. yes. And it depends upon how fast you are in removing the uh, inciting factor, like infection or yeah. hypertension. So, the precipitation. Uh, yeah. And second, uh, a comment I wanted to make was about the third case. Though you uh, told that uh, the anticoagulant therapy is usually reserved for the patients who have some risk factors such as. Uh, uh thrombophilias or uh, something like many pro thrombotic yeah, uh, but, but uh, actually there are case, uh, studies and there are case reports when they have no pro thrombotic they have been started on anticoagulation there have yeah. been cases yeah. because they wanted uh, the thrombus not to ascend up to the superior mesenteric uh, vessels yes, so, otherwise it would lead to the intestinal involvement and yes, that would be increasing the morbidity so uh, in our mm -hmm. case also we are routinely giving the anticoagulants okay. in ehp also Thank you. So they were the two, uh, two comments that I wanted to Thank make. Thank you, ma'am. So relevant. And good, yeah. good evening, uh, Sangeeta, ma'am. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. <laughs> and, uh, uh, very I was. Good. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, it's a whole and soul Dr. Taru's effort because most of the faculty is on leave, on vacation. So Dr. Taru uh, got lots of involved in these cases, and it is her uh, show. And I am really thankful to all of you, and thank to uh, Dr. Saru also. And I uh, wish you all a very, very, very happy New Year 2021. Wish you all a very happy. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Ma we thank all the members. We thank all the members for joining with us, and thank seniors for giving valuable input, especially on the first day of the year. And I also take a, take an opportunity to thank Jackson Pal and especially Dr. Dipika Chabra. And EOGD office to provide us with logistic support and arranging a virtual platform for us. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Once again, a very happy new year to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Taru. Thanks for excellent coordination and for excellent cases by all the presenters and very well managed, in fact. And all the cases were very well presented and well in time. Uh, so I thank all the presenters as well as I thank all the esteemed judges for their uh, uh, for being here today and giving their time and making the session so interactive. And uh, with this note, I now because Dr. Kanika had to leave, I say thanks to all uh, to the team ESI and uh, as well as Jackson Pal and all the audience and all the viewers uh, for viewing today's uh, AOG virtual monthly clinical meeting. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, yeah. everyone, Thank and happy new year to everyone. Happy new year, ma'am. Happy, 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 happy new year to AG. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Jackson Pal, I would also like to thank all. Uh, Jackson Pal as the makers of doxycycline 100 mg as doxypal DRL capsules, lycored preg sachet of L arginine, lycopene, and DHA to prevent pregnancy complications. And we have Diva just 200 and 300 natural progesterone, sustained release oral tablets. We have our newly launched Algos Pass tablets containing drotaverin and mephinemic acid 
and also now uh, calcium citrate malate tablets of uh, calcium citrate malate as nari cal so my teammates dr vipin tyagi and mr amit saxena joined me to thank all the experts present here with us today and we would like to reassure all of you our extended support to your future activities also thank you for you. a long way in knowledge sharing with the unending support of all the attendees and we hope to see you again in our next webinar uh, next one happening now on january 9th so we wish you all a very happy and healthy new year thank you so much